Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about establishing identity uh, in the context of three recent launches from William Grant & Sons. Uh, Canimvi Single Malt Scotch, the Govan Patent Still Single Grain Scotch, and Elsa Bay uh, Single Malt Scotch. Before I get into the specifics of that, I just want to uh, answer the question, you know, what do we mean by identity? My definition of identity is all the visual aspects that go to make up part of the overall brand. So things like the logo, brochures, signage, advertising, promotions, websites, and of course, the pack design. It's the pack design that I'm going to concentrate on today, you know, developing the packaging to establish an identity, because it plays such a crucial part in establishing the identity. There's an old adage, your pack is your best salesman. We encounter whiskey brands behind the bar, on the shop shelf, whether physical or virtual. The pack is always there. Whereas advertising campaigns, promotional activity, tastings and so on are less permanent. They're transient by nature. So your pack has to do a lot of the hard work in establishing the identity for a new brand. In a much cluttered whiskey environment, your pack has to have impact. It has to stand out from the crowd, but it has to stand out for a reason. There has to be a truth behind the brand so that when people scratch beneath the surface, you know, there's, a, there's a genuine real story. It's what the marketing idiots call the reason to believe. <laughs> In all these packs I'm going to talk about, uh, the William Grant's family heritage uh, has played a really important part in, in establishing the identity. As Ludo said, we're, we're still a family company uh, to this day, and that family ethos runs through everything we do. First brand I want to talk about is uh, Kinimvi. The Kinimvi distillery was opened in July 1990 by a lady called Janet Sheed Roberts who was the last remaining granddaughter of William Grant. But the first release from the distillery under the Kinimvi name wasn't until October 2013, 23 years later. So, you know, it was almost as if the family had kept it a secret to themselves. Whilst the uh, mash tuns and the washbacks uh, are under the, the same roof as the Balvenie distillery, it's in a separate part of the building, hidden away. The still house is over 50 meters away, again, hidden away down in the valley. The, the, the public are not allowed to see the, the distillery, it's not open to, uh, to visitors. All the whiskey was going to the blended market. But it was amazing liquid, it, it was like a, a hidden gem. And that sense of, of, of a hidden gem, a family secret, a reclusive treasure, inspired the thinking behind the development of the brand. So there was a deliberate decision not to advertise it. There is no website. That was deliberate because we, we wanted to have this sense of something that's sort of secret and hidden. If you look at the pack, it's dark. It's quite hard to read the logo, and the logo itself, you know, it, it sort of wraps around the, the box, not revealing everything at once. And the box, it's actually quite difficult to get into, just like the distillery. You have to open the, open the lid, then you peel it back, and that. Then there's a little tab. You pull on the tab, and then you get the bottle. Sorry. And it's only a half bottle. We have an expression back home, good things come in small packages. So we wanted to convey a sense of, of, of something precious. We took inspiration from the perfume industry here, where you see lots of elaborate uh, boxes. You, you peel back the layers to open up this, the, these beautiful little bottles inside. And it's a similar thinking. The thinking behind that was, you know, that's, that's the hidden gem, this, this sort of little jewel. And the jewel, of course, is the liquid, 
but it all gets back to that truth of, you know, this sort of sense of a, of, of a reclusive treasure. There are other reasons, of course. Uh, as, as a family company, William Grant liked to do things a bit differently. So your first release as a 23-year-old and only in a half bottle is certainly unusual. But we also noticed trends, and, and, and th there was, we saw an increasing demand from whiskey enthusiasts and collectors for rare and special releases. So the first releases were all, all batch numbered. So you had the batch number there, bottle number there, and, and year of distillation. And collectors, when they buy uh, bottles, they, they like to buy two, one to drink and one to collect. So having a half bottle facilitated that. And keeping it in, in limited releases, again, got back to this sense of, you know, we want, we want to um, make it hard to find, j just, just like the distillery itself. Moving on from a brand that we wanted to keep, you know, hidden behind a box, to one that we wanted to show off in a picture frame box, the Gervin Patent Still. The Gervin Patent Still Single Grain Scotch was launched in October 2013 as well. Up until then, apart from a few independent bottlers, no one was really doing anything with, with single grain scotch. And we thought, um, you know, there, there was an opportunity to create a third, third pillar in scotch after blends and, and the single malt category. Could we create, you know, a, a single grain category? We felt the trends were favourable. Single malt enthusiasts don't just drink single malt scotch. Uh, they have a very wide repertoire, they're experimental. Lots of them knew we had a, a single grain distillery in Gervin and said, why don't you come out with a, with, with a single grain? The other thing we were noticing single malt enthusiasts were drinking a lot of was, was, was Japanese whiskey. And we were seeing that Nikka coffee single grain was getting a lot of interest and a lot of traction out there. So in terms of the, the way the trends were going, we thought the timing was right. But there are also bigger macro trends. Whilst there, there was at that time, uh, and, and still is, a burgeoning craft distilling movement, generally people were becoming interested in the science of things. So science was, was becoming cool. You know, people in the UK would be familiar with Professor Brian Cox's programs and Dar O'Brien, you know. It's, it's people are interested in science. So we thought, well, you know, let's look at the engineering side of things. So you, 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 the science and engineering of the Gervin distillery to create great liquid, as opposed to craft to create great liquid. And it does produce this, this amazing, uh, well, if anybody of you tasted the 28-year-old yesterday, this sort of liquid creme brulee, stunning liquid. But it's all based on engineering at the still. So the brand was to have a, a, a modern, contemporary outlook, but it was still you know, rooted in the distilling tradition and heritage of William Grant's. And the first thing when, when, when you create identity is, is, you know, is the name. Why did we call it the Gervin Patent Still Single Grain Scotch? Gervin Single Grain would have been so much easier. A uh, couple of reasons. As I mentioned earlier, you know, th th there's lots of independent bottlings of single grain, including Gervin. And as long as an independent bottler sticks to agreed font sizes and says distilled at the Gervin distillery, uh, th there's nothing to stop them calling uh, their grain Gervin single grain. So we wanted to avoid that confusion and own the trademark. But it was more than that, it was also key to establishing the identity and that sense of engineering and science. I mean, I think the name, the Gervin patent still, is kind of reminiscent of the industrial 1960s when the, uh, the, the distillery was stab established. I mean, that's Charles uh, Grant Gordon, the great grandson of William Grant, our founder, next to number one apps that was built, uh, that's the name of the still, was built in, in 1963. Like, you know, the Gervin patent still, sounds strong and proud, just like Charlie himself. The name also gives a, a clue as to the production method, so, you know, patent or column distillation. 
And lastly, uh, it, it gives a nod to the innovation and, and pioneering uh, legacy that is, is William Grant's in that word patent. Because in 1992, William Grant's received a joint patent with the Alco of Finland for multi-pressure vacuum distillation. And that's, that's number four and five apps you see there and, and the previous slide. So the name sort of linked back to those truths behind the brand. The bottle itself is reflective of the distillery and the distillation method. So the, the bottle shape was designed to be deliberately taller and more slender than the most single malt bottles or whisk, traditional whiskey bottles. And that's because it mimics uh, the column of a column still. The packaging has an overall, I, I think, an overall light and elegant feel to it, just like the liquid inside. Th this sort of deliciously different liquid that it's, it, it's not like malts and it's uh, different to blends. It has a, it's a lighter style of whiskey. We wanted to show off that beautiful bottle and beautiful liquid, which is why we put it in a, in, in a picture frame. But we also wanted to break with convention, because if you think about it, not, not many people, apart from a few sort of whiskey geeks, knew about, about single grain scotch. So if we, if we put it in the, uh, on the shelf looking like other whiskey bottles, it would get lost. We, we had to make it stand out. But I hope you, you get the point that it's, it's standing out for a reason. Initially, this was to be uh, aimed at single malt enthusiasts, so we knew it was going to be put on the shelf, probably um, and next to Lowland whiskies. So, so it had to stand out. Moving on to another brand that breaks with convention, I want to finish up talking about Ailsa Bay. Ailsa Bay Single Malt is our first release from our state-of-the-art distillery built on the Girvan site. Um, it was built in 2007. If anybody has uh, been to the Balvenie distillery, you will notice a remarkable similarity to the, the shapes of the stills at Ailsa Bay. And that was for a reason. The majority of the production of the Ailsa Bay distillery actually is producing a a, a space side style of, of single malt. We haven't been supplying Balvenie to the, the blended market for years. We haven't got enough for our own needs, but there was still a demand for, for a similar space side style. So the, the majority of the production goes to the blended market. But the distillery produces a number of different styles, including a heavily peated style. Uh, Peter Gordon was our chairman at the time. Uh, the distillery was, was being built, and he wanted the signature style to be a heavily peated single malt, but have less of the medicinal notes. He wanted to you know, boost the sweetness. So, as he said, he wanted the perfect balance of smoke and sweet. But we realized that you know, we can't out Isla Isla, where most of the heavily peated uh, whiskey comes from. In terms of establishing identity, we can't out-heritage uh, distilleries that have been there hundreds of years. So instead, let's celebrate what we've got. We've got a modern 21st century distillery, purpose-built to create great whiskey for whiskey lovers. So it's all about the scientific approach. It's all about uh, precision distillation and, and micromaturation. And the bottle itself um, is very different to traditional single malt bottles. Uh, it has sort of a, I think, the look of something that's, that's come out of the science lab. But it also allows us to, to tell a story. So, for example, here we say precision distillation in, in a little octagonal shape. And that's reflective of, of our octagonal spirit safe, where we have great control over the, um, over the, the cut points. You know, the, the purpose-built distillery has great control and flexibility over different styles of whiskey and a range of, of spirit cut points. For example, we have a couple of stainless steel condensers on some of the stills to give a, a more meaty, sulfury style of spirit. So th th there's lots of scientific, technological stuff going on in the distillery that we think the, the pack celebrates. 
And here we talk about you know, micro-maturation. What does that mean? It refers to two things. First of all, an innovative technique where we put the new make spirit into X Hudson baby bourbon cask of 25 liters for a few months, uh, initial rapid maturation. Then we transfer it into a refill cask for you know, a more standard, um, slower maturation. It also refers to the, the, the attention to detail in the maturation process. So we would be um, moving liquids across a number of different uh, types of casks, you know, refill, first fill bourbon, virgin oak, shifting it from cask to cask, depending on how the whiskey is maturing in order to you know, get those sweetness levels up. The warehousemen hate us. We're moving around a lot of whiskey, different cask sizes. Those Hudson casks, okay, they're 25 liters, some are 50 liters, but they're all different shapes and sizes. So some casks look like cylinders, some are fat. So you know, th th there's, a, there's a lot of work that goes on in, in, in the distillery. And when I, I talk about you know, the perfect balance of smoke and sweet, ah, come on, Kevin, yeah, that's, that's just a William Grant sign, sound bite. Well, it's not, because we've measured it. We mentioned that on the pack too. PPPM, you'd be familiar with that, phenol parts per million, and SPPPM. So the SPPPM, sweetness parts per million, is our own proprietary uh, measure. That in, in, in the lab, there, there, there's compounds we routinely measure for, for sweetness and different things. We pick five of those and we compare those against the PPPM to give us uh, 21 to 11. That to us is the perfect balance of smoke and sweet. That, that's in the liquid, by the way. So, so the, the PPM is measured in the liquid, which we think is the most true measure of, of how peaty a whiskey is. So that's the, the, how the bottle addresses the science side of things. But the label also allows us to tell a story of, of our place, where we come from. So we have a, a map on the bottle. There's the Girvan site, where the Elsa Bay distillery is. And out to sea, there's this island called Ailsa Craig. Ailsa Craig uh, is a volcanic rock 15 kilometers off the, Ayrshire, off the Ayrshire coast, from which the distillery takes its name. It's famous for a very special type of granite called blue hone granite that is used to make curling stones. And we have a piece of that granite on the lid. So again, we, we talk about the science, but you know, the place where you come from is really important, and that just sort of talks to the place. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I've had shown you, taken you through the development of three very different um, pack designs, but all of them have a truth. They have a truth of family, of the distillery, the type of distillation, and it all relates back to the liquid inside. I think in establishing identity for a, for a whiskey brand, it's really important to find out what your, your truths are and use those to create your own identity. Thank you. Any questions from the floor about this, about these brands? Yes. <laughs> Inevitably. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, working for a, a, a company like William Grant, where you have so many separate distilleries and so many separate you know, beautiful brands, is it not especially difficult to establish a separate identity for all these brands? Um, it, it can be, but I, I, th I think that's, that's part of the challenge because, uh, you know, e even though uh, we are um, part of the same family, to a certain extent, your brands are competing with, e with, e with each other, you know, in, in, in the, in the wide, wider whiskey world. So you have to find a point of view for your, for your signature release from the distillery. You know, I mean, Canimvi was, was our, our third space side single malt distillery. There's no point in in the liquid or the brand looking like Glenfiddich or Balvenie. So um, it, it, it can be a challenge, but, but you, if, if you don't make it different, people will just think, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just another 
Space Side Whiskey from William Grant. So you, you have to create an identity. And also, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously, I mean, Gervin, you saw the picture of the distillery. It's very different from a, from a sort of a small copper pot still in the Highlands. So, so in, in that sense, you have things to work on. And, and Ailsa Bay, it was just, the thinking is, is what we couldn't be. So sometimes that, that helps define what you are, is actually it's, it's what we don't want to be. And, and that, that can help the thought process. I think you, you, you just take, accept the fact that actually people do not drink just Glenfiddich, just Grants, Balvenny. Whiskey drinkers have a wide repertoire of, of brands, so you, you just take it in, in that sense that you, you know you, we, we want to be part of their repertoire, part of their portfolio. It gives them alternatives within, but, but also as, as people grow on, on, on the whiskey journey, sometimes they, they go with a brand and for whatever reason, they want to progress to another. So for, for those uh, people who, who are exploring whiskies, we just want to make sure that, okay, if, if you're trying to, if you're going to consider a new brand, how about these? I, I, I think there's, there's a great future for, for whiskey, and you know, I, I, I'd say that there's absolutely hope for um, smaller distilleries. We, we touched on the emerging markets yesterday, and you know, people actually have said, you know, is, it, is there going to be um, a whiskey bubble? Is the bubble with all these distilleries and this extra production going to burst? I, I, don't, I don't think so. In, by 2030 there's going to be an extra 50 million people in India who have an income over 50,000 a year. Just when the whiskey stocks we're laying down now are maturing. There's going to be, uh, at that time, 2030, uh, a middle class of Indians of, of 583 million people. In China, there's going to be um, over 15 million people with incomes over 150,000 in 2030. So, I, I, you know, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm right, but, you know, if, if, you, if you think about that they have a taste for whiskey, particularly in India, where, uh, you know, they have 150 million non-eater cases of, I mean, they call it whiskey, but it's it, of ersatz whiskey that, you know, they want to progress up and, and, and drink scotch. So I, th I think there's a great future. For, for the Scotch whisky industry. Johnny, you have some money. Yeah. It's just interesting the, the, the timing of these releases, Kevin, because the, well, what we said about diversity, so remember somebody telling me at Edrington that, well, yeah, it's uh, Glen Turret, that uh, at Edrington we were wondering up and down going, is it going to crash the store? Is it going to crash the store? And they were like, going, a lot of people say, you've got one. You know? um, and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think people are interested in, in you know, in, you, you talked about diversity of whiskey, but they're, they're just interested in, the, the, I think there's a renewed interest in flavours in general. So people want to find out about the flavour of things, you know, the science of things, Heston Blumenthal, that sort of um, science in gastronomy. So there's a lot of interest in that. So, for instance, before uh, I, I joined uh, William Grant's back in the mid-90s, we, we did have a single grain called Black Barrel. It's a super product, um, but it just, it, it, you know, it just didn't go anywhere. And I, I don't think at that time you, you had this interest in experimentation and exploration. 
uh, which, which we're seeing now. I think the guys, you know, when we um, acquired the Hudson Distillery, that, that was an eye-opener. And, you know, I was saying that to you yesterday. I mean, you know, we're, we're not here to teach you guys. We learned an awful lot from, from those guys in Hudson, the way they do things unconventionally. Uh, and, and also the way they, they, they did their limited releases. So, so that, that not only helped the thinking behind Ailsa Bay, but also Kinvey as well. So, you know, we're, we're learning from, from the smaller guys as well in terms of the, the innovative ways you, you, you launch new releases. Yeah. Yeah. My question. Uh, I, th I think the answer to that question was actually um, we didn't integrate them because I've, I've been I've been I've been to the distillery in Tuttletown and you, you know you're stepping over pipes you're, you're bending under things and then they, where, where they put the, the the wax on on the thing literally there's there's a pan on the um, uh, you know, on, on the line where, where they put the wax. I said, Ralph, you know, how did you get away with this? And it's, uh, he gets away with it because he's, he's, he's regarded as a farm, actually, because they, they grow their own grains. And, and because the US uh, government department supports agriculture, maybe, Tony, maybe there's something around that in the, in the EU, but because the, the US government is keen to support agriculture and because he's classed as a farm, he's exempt from a lot of the health and safety things. But... Get but some cows, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> but we, uh, you know, it, it, so it would have been very, at uh, the first it would have been very uh, easy to say, come on, we, you've got to conform with it without health and safety standards at Glenfiddich. But we realised that they had something special. I mean, you know, the, um, what they're doing with casks and how that, that rapid um, acceleration of, of maturation produces a great whiskey, which is only one or two years old in Hudson Baby Bourbon. So we, we said, actually, you're doing a good job. Keep going. Uh, and uh, we actually learned from them, as you saw, saw in Ailsa Bay. So, yeah, hands off. It's hands off. Thank you. I'm afraid we've kind of run out of time for this one. There's a couple of points I want to pick up, but, but later on, certainly that, that issue of diversity, I think it's uh, one of the themes that's uh, developing uh, over the, this morning's chat. So I really want to pick up on that. But uh, until a little while okay. in the future, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.